All right. Well, it's wonderful to be here, the old man of TEDx Penn, uh, but, but uh, uh, trying for eternal youth. So I'm going to take you back in time. I want to start in, if we can get you there, uh, the, the glorious month of May 2000, when the economy was booming and Bill Clinton was having regrets about Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> And Mark Zuckerberg was just a high school nerd at the time. And, and I want to take you specifically to May 18th, because on that day, I got a call from a lawyer. Uh, they were proposing me to get involved as an expert witness in some case. I get these calls all the time. I say no most of the time. But this one was kind of interesting, because it tapped into some of my interests, uh, both in the, the music industry as well as the emerging internet thing. I developed a lot of models over the years to look at how sales patterns of albums vary from one type to another. Uh, I've looked at uh, how the popularity of songs comes and goes. And I've looked at the, the patterns online and offline for, for sales of, of albums. And, and of course, there's no suspense now. You've heard the title of the talk. You know that we're talking about Napster. Uh, so I had this moral obligation to help the cause, not only because it fit with my research interests, but for the, because the previous six months, I've been using Napster quite a bit myself. And, I don't know how many of you had the joy of using the original Napster. It was a great thing. Meeting all kinds of new people, learning about all kinds of new music, downloading some music along the way too. So, uh, so I, I jumped on in in, in the, the, the war over Napster. Uh, and so I just want to talk a little bit about this, this battle. In, in this corner, big, evil, greedy, blood-sucking corporations. <laughs> and in this corner, poor startup entrepreneur, and the woman who was assigned to judge it was in no position to do so for reasons that I'll tell you. So I had a teeny tiny role in the Napster case. And of course, I'm minimizing it because they lost, right? Because <laughs> uh, really, the whole case hinged on, well, legal stuff, OK? And I'm no lawyer. I have no appreciation for law. I don't understand all of that. But my part of it was quite different. My part of it was to look at the, the impact that the use of this file sharing platform had on the music industry. And so I went out and did all this research, and I found that the, the evidence showed overwhelming support for the contention that Napster was beneficial for the music industry. And I stand tall and, and, and believe that passionately. Napster was the greatest thing for the music industry. The industry likes to paint a picture that looks like this, right? This over here is music sales, and this over here is unauthorized file sharing, right? And they like to say there's some causality there, that this is causing this. But it kind of begs the question, when did this begin? When did sales reach their all-time high before they started that eternal decline? And of course, the answer is the spring of 2000, as the usage of Napster was peaking. Now, did one cause the other? Well, kind of, all right? But, but more important than that, it's to recognize that during that spring of 2000, people were far more engaged with the music industry than they ever were before and they ever will be for the rest of eternity. People were so passionate about music. It was music, 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 and it was all because of Napster. Again, meeting new people, learning new kinds of music, focusing far more on music instead of things like family or sports or religion. <laughs> it's time for that later on. It was all about the music. And Napster was really a great thing. To, and, and I'll give you a little bit more proof about it uh, on the very next slide. Uh, of course, Judge Patel didn't see it that way. Uh, in, in her evaluation of my report, it was something along the lines of the contention that unauthorized file sharing can be good for the industry is, is ridiculous. And therefore, any research that goes to show that has to be gravely flawed. Okay, that was basically the logic to ignore my little tiny piece of it. Uh, so let me give you one, one bit of evidence, and by no means it's the only piece of evidence, about the impact that this kind of file sharing has on, on, on positive music sales. I want to talk about an, an artist. I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, a fellow by the name of Curtis Jackson, that, that at the time that Napster was being shut down and replaced by a zillion other unauthorized file sharing networks, he hadn't had any, any albums at the time, but he had a few songs, and they got out there, and people shared them, spoke about them, downloaded them like crazy. He was signed by a major label, Interscope Records. They were going to launch his album in March of 2003. But there was so much of this activity going on, this downloading and unauthorized sharing, that they panicked. They said, we can't wait until the end of March 
to launch this album. We have to get it out there as quickly as possible to salvage whatever sales we can get before it's just all gone. And so they rushed this album to market, and they launched it in the first week of February 2003. It was so rushed that they didn't have a, a full week. They didn't launch it on cycle, just like movies always launched on a Friday. It was launched midweek. But despite all of these very unfavorable circumstances, turns out that this album, uh, or, or this artist, who you might know as 50 Cent, um, absolutely demolished the record for most sales in the first week by a debut artist. Sold 872,000 copies of that album. Okay? Again, no one has ever sold as many before, and certainly no one will sell as, as many uh, uh, forever. I'm willing to bet on that. Uh, and it's interesting that if you were to ask 50 Cent what, what he thinks about it, he'd say, it's great, it's terrific. It's a terrific way for people to connect with each other and discover my music and so on. He says all the best things about it. But when you ask people in the music industry, love what they say about it, they say, you can't look at this bestseller and say piracy's not a problem. We don't know how many more albums you would have sold. <laughs> They're so totally missing the point of this wonderful asset that they had that they could have harnessed, that they couldn't quite figure out. In fact, let me just back up. This is 2003. I'm going to back up to 2000, when all this stuff was starting out. And so there's Sean Fanning, the founder of Napster. And you can't read it down here, but it says that, uh, uh, that who knows, his technology could fly high or crash and burn. But either way, the technology that he's unleashed is the next big thing. And what's that technology? Okay, yes, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, this and that. But what was Napster the first of its kind? It was the first social network. Because, yeah, there were other platforms for geeks and nerds to talk to each other, but it was the first really broad platform where kind of regular people had a reason to get a computer and get on the Internet. They finally had some reason to do it. And it really, when I told you what we did with Napster, it was more about connecting with people and learning stuff than it was about the downloading of the music. It was a terrific thing. And again, the industry tried eh, to harness this technology themselves. You might remember some of the services that they developed, things like press play and so on. They couldn't get it right. And so we turned to 2003. So I'm going to show you a picture over here. Okay, you'll recognize the face instantly, but I'm not asking you to do so. I want you to tell me what four-letter adjective will describe the expression on the face. Okay? So tell me, what is this expression? Smug. Okay, everyone gets it. You, you, you put this picture into Google and the word smug comes out. Okay? And why is this gentleman so smug? Well, I'll give you two possible reasons for it. Reason number one is because he's listening to whatever's going on in Show of Crow's Pants. That <laughs> might be a reason. Reason number two is that the music industry, after failing to figure this thing out themselves, basically gave him the keys to the car and said, Steve, you're the savior. You go figure it out. And Steve is smug because he couldn't give a rat's ass about the music industry. What does he want to do? He wants to sell shiny objects, right? <laughs> and all this music stuff is just a means towards that end. And he does that extraordinarily well. I can only give him credit for it. But he truly doesn't care. And the business model that he came up with, the iTunes Music Store, launched in the fall of 2003, is absolutely the worst possible thing for the music industry. I went on record saying that this will be an absolute cancer for the music industry. The, the a la carte nature of it, the way it moves people away from albums, the way at the time that it moved people away from community, because he's not into sharing very much, at least wasn't at the time. Uh, so it was just a terrible thing for the industry, great thing for him and his shareholders. So let's fast forward a few more years. This is 2003, and finally, it was too late for the music industry, but what about other content-oriented industries? All of a sudden, they realize that, you know what? Maybe he's not our friend. <laughs> Maybe he has his own interests in mind, which he's probably the first to admit that he does, and we've got to be a little bit more cautious about it. So things are starting to change. It's a little bit too late for the music industry, but it's interesting to talk about some of the other implications more recently. Later that year, 2006, something happened that I went on record saying it was the biggest business development deal in digital media history. It's a deal that probably none of you are aware of. But it stems from the fact that, uh, that these, these big executives in the music industry were sick and tired of people creating videos of their 
cat lip syncing to Madonna songs, saying, that's our content. We have the right to dictate who gets to use the content and how. These people have no right to do it, and so we should sue them, right? On September 19, 2006, Warner Music went against the grain. And Warner Music, instead of getting all out outraged about it and suing people, they said, you know what? It's better that they make videos of a cat lip syncing to Madonna, since she's one of our artists, instead of making videos of them lip syncing to Gwen Stefani or Christina Aguilera. Okay? So he, he finally had the impression uh, that we want to lean through innovation as opposed to litigation. It was an amazing thing, an incredible, unfortunately too late for <clears throat> other parts of the industry, <clears throat> but an incredible time. Within days of that, <clears throat> excuse me, all of the other labels, <clears throat> except one, jumped on board and also licensed their content to YouTube. And then what happened a week after that? Google bought YouTube. <laughs> Causality? I don't know. <laughs> Very, very impactful. Now, I wish I could end here. I wish we could say everything is happy now, but it's not. And so a couple of years ago, uh-oh, here we go again, lawsuits. Viacom, very upset. They don't like the idea that if you want to watch, let's say, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, where do you go? YouTube. They said, you can't do that. You need to go to ComedyCentral.com. And so they sue Google for a billion dollars. They issue all these, all these shutdown notices. So you go, you want to watch The Daily Show, you go to YouTube, like any normal person, and you see horrible messages emerge. You now have a choice. Choice number one, you browse over to ComedyCentral.com and you watch The Daily Show over there. Choice number two, you stay on YouTube and you watch videos of people's cats lip syncing to Madonna songs. <laughs> Which one do you choose? Option B, right? Everyone chooses that. And so when they issue these kinds of takedown notices, they are absolutely destroying the value of their content. I seriously can't believe that there wasn't a shareholder lawsuit filed against Viacom for doing so. They're absolutely destroying their content. Of course, this, bad, this bit of bad news has good news because just a couple of months ago, the judge said that what uh, YouTube has been doing is totally fine, it's all good, it's all legal, and so on. So again, we're still on this roller coaster ride. And, and, and last slide, I promise, just this week, we're still experiencing these, these downs and these ups. Because we all know that Congress is about to, to finish up for the season. They have uh, uh, bigger things to, to worry about. Uh, and so they were trying to sneak through a really horrible internet censorship bill that would have put US on the same level as, as basically China and North Korea for the ability of what companies could do with, with individuals and so on. And they were hoping just to slide this thing through at a time when nobody was noticing. And fortunately, this is an article just from yesterday. Uh, they, they finally came in and, and uh, s some representatives of Congress came in and said, let's just kind of push this thing aside and not deal with it right now and not give into it. And of course, people in the content uh, creation industry are all upset that they're not getting their way and they're not going to be able to snoop and sue and so on. But it shows that there is hope, but it also shows that there's still great danger out there. So I'm hoping that, that I think all of us have learned from it. I think the University of Pennsylvania has learned for better and for worse about how we should be dealing with these kinds of technologies. Uh, but there's still uh, uh, battles to be fought. So let's just go back uh, over here. So we're talking about the, the war over Napster. And it's fair to say that when it comes specifically to Napster, to that original peer-to-peer -peer social network or file sharing platform, it's fair to say that the music industry won that war. But in closing, I'd like to point out that the industry and other content creation businesses are losing the battles. They've, certainly in the music industry, they've lost the battle for the hearts and minds of their customers, and there is no getting that back. They're, they're lost, and other content industries are losing the control over their content and their businesses that they used to have, that they think they deserve, that their lawyers and sometimes the legislators they have in their pocket often say they deserve, but that's not the way to run a business. Uh, and so they're, they're really losing that kind of control, and I think it's not too late to, to get it on back. But I think we need to be vigilant, 
Uh, and I think we need to be aware of all of these different steps and, and, and not forget what happened uh, way back in the, the, the glorious spring of 2000. So with that, I want to thank you. And of course, if anyone wants to, to follow up, wants to argue with me about any of this stuff, <laughs> I know I'll be hearing from people in the music industry. <laughs> I'd be delighted to pick up the conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>